we want to do to do something that we haven't done before and that is answer a handful of questions that people have written in about that would be of value to other people so we're going to give it a stab see how this goes we've got a question here from Micah who's asking about twin tenons and he says that I have alluded to the use of twin tenons double tenons on certain pieces of uh, woodworking in the past where we've had two tenons going side by side and he says that he's going to be doing a two inch uh, rail going into a, th a three and a quarter inch square leg so we've got two pieces of material here he's talking about this going in here so he's saying would he use twin tenons or would he use a single tenon I would say use a single tenon because you can use a fairly substantial tenon on this going into this size of a leg you could do um, a longish tenon you could do a two up to a two and a half inch tenon in this quite comfortably one and a half would be long enough and I would go with a three quarter inch tenon if this was wider and the rail was bigger and this was going into a massive door I might do two side by side tenons as twin tenons but I might also have a door rail this size where I need a double tenon where one is above the other or even have four in a single rail those are very rare um, choices today because we have aluminium and we have other metals and things that answer that question but that's my answer for you Micah so yeah a three quarter inch tenon going into a three quarter inch um, mortise hole is plenty good for what you want the next question came in from Connor and he's asking can you talk about the transitional planes well he's got a series of planes that were made in America uh, he names um, Millers Falls, Stanley, Sargent, Union and Fulton were all transitional planes what a transitional plane is very different than these planes this is a fairly common we all know about the Stanley before Stanley could get this to be accepted as a plane people were using wooden planes wooden soles wooden bodied and um, and those planes never uh, you couldn't bend them you couldn't flex them you can flex metal planes if you want to or need to but in this case he wants to know about the difference between those different breeds of plane well the answer is that all of them worked and worked well they were basic much uh, basically much of a muchness you couldn't really differentiate between I've actually used most of those planes and couldn't find any one that was better than the other so yes go ahead and buy them if you get the opportunity his next question was some of them can be had for much cheaper okay we'll leave that I've also heard you mention that long metal planes can flex but wooden ones do not I've just answered that wooden planes wouldn't bend you couldn't bend them because of the nature of the wood uh, you, I said that wood skates and glides across the surface of wood this was the big difference this was why Stanley could not get the status quo uh, woodworkers of the time to change from wooden planes to metal planes because they were so light it wasn't the weight of the plane it was the interaction between the wood uh, and the sole of the plane so if it was a wooden plane it would glide across the surface like a swan across a lake but when it came to the metal planes they stuck to the surface and um, and they would pull and drag and so uh, that was the main reason so for 40 years Stanley made a plane that had it was basically this plane on a wooden sole just like this and the wood against wood resolved the issue but eventually the knowledge of knowing about those planes the wooden planes diminished because the planes were used a lot less they were expensive to make gradually he filtered in and to a completely all metal version the one we're used to today so we go with the lightweight planes we recommend them over some of the heavyweights that have crept in on the market um, because you know of chatter they say that the heavy planes and the thick irons cause chatter uh, uh, relieve chatter that's not the case usually it's to do with the friction of the sole on the surface of the wood that causes the most scudding and chatter that you get so if you just use an oil in a rag like this on the underside of your sole and then you can take the shavings you get no chatter it's perfect all right uh, so I've given that answer as best I know Christoph asks I have recently bought a, a used Stanley number no. five I need to fix and resharpen the iron which is heavily out of square 
I can't justify purchasing diamond stones which you recommend. Do you think I could go ahead with just sandpaper? Yes, you can. And actually, most of the time, much of the time, I will go with like a 60 grit. If I've got a, a, a plain iron, I've just bought a plane, it's badly shaped, it's, it needs some resurfacing, it needs some extra work doing it. I will buy a roll of uh, roll sandpaper, the type that we use for, say, sanding the floor where you wrap it in a spiral. Um, and that works perfectly. It's got some very coarse grit to it. You set that up on a, on a flat surface, grind the bevel on that, use a honing guide if you want to, use it freehand, and that will take the iron down and get it square. Actually, I think it actually works quicker than diamonds do. So yes, go ahead and do that. And you can actually continue, if you can't afford the diamond stones, just get abrasive paper on a flat surface. If you're only doing the bevel, that is if you've initialized the flat face of say your chisels, you only have to do that once, then in that case, um, once you've initialized them, which, has to, which usually is done on a, flat, a dead flat surface like granite or glass, you don't have to, when you're honing this, it doesn't matter whether this has a, a hollow in it. it, it's actually even beneficial if it does. So you can actually hone a bevel, you can see on here, I use a convex on the bevel, I like that, it really works well for me. And so yeah, you can use the sandpaper and you can go through all the grits to 1200 and you don't actually need to strop um, the uh, bevel and polish it out like I do, but it's just that extra measure, it just takes so little time, you may as well do it. And of course I do that on my strop. So that's just a question, a piece of leather glued to a piece of plywood, pull this across the surface vigorously 30 to 40 times and that will polish out the bevel. So that's how I would do it. Yeah. So yes, use abrasive paper, it's great, but you can't, if long term it's going to be more expensive than the diamonds. So the second question Christoph has, was it Chris? Yeah. Um, about hand saws. I spent months browsing in uh, the office of local sellers but either looks like bad plastic handle saws, good enough for firewood or overpriced luxury style tool. Do you have any tip on existing brand which makes decent affordable hand saws? Well I understand what you mean about the plastic handles. The old plastic handles were actually molded and really fit quite well to your hand. They don't quite fit the same as the wooden ones do. Wood has never really ever been replaced in my view and so the quality you get from wood you can't replace it with a plastic handle or even a resin handle. There's all kinds of molded processes that go to give you that. You can of course make your own uh, handle which would probably take you two or three hours uh, but at the end of it you'd have tremendous satisfaction from that from that source. So I would probably recommend Veritas makes good uh, uh, smaller hand saws, um, tenon saws, back saws, gent styles, pistol grips. They have very nice, very comfortable handles and their saws are coming at a, a fairly good price in my book. Uh, but then again, you can also go to Spear and Jackson. They've come out with some saws that I think give you good steel, a good handle, and you may need to work on them. We've got some videos out on that to upgrade those. So. That's that one. Robert asks, he, I acquired a distant type 7 rip saw with a beautiful applewood handle. The problem is it has a slight bow. I watched your video on straightening a back saw. Do you have a video on straightening a hand saw? It's hard to find a saw doctor nowadays. It's so simple. Here I've got a saw. Now this one is straight. The blade is straight. So if I look down here, it has a slight curve this way. What you do is, I'm going to bend this one out. I'm going to put a bolt in it. So there, you can see now, I've got a fairly consistent bow along the, the length. I'll, I'm just going to tell you I have if you can't see it. All we do is we go exactly the opposite, quite vigorously, and we can go the opposite way. So what I have now is I have a bow going the opposite way. That's no good. So I just go back this way. And now I have a dead straight saw. So here is my saw, it's dead straight. It's just a question of boldly going where no man goes. That will do for, for it. So that's that one. Very simple. Uh, Bjorn asks, in one video I see Paul Sellers using a rolled up rag in a small tin can. Ooh, we've seen this so many times and so many times I've had to answer this. Um, this is a rag rolled up tightly and then pressed down into a can and I just put 
like machine oil on this? That's the question is, which oil do you use? In lots of European countries, certainly in America, you can get an oil referred to as light machine oil called three-in-one oil. But wherever you are in the world, whichever oil you would use to oil, say, a lock or the hinge of a door, the hinge of your car, that will work. Don't use oils that will spontaneously combust. Go to uh, Google up um, spontaneous, uh, spontaneously combustible oils and you'll find lots of good information there that I don't need to go through again. That will answer that question. Just top this up. You just take your oil, put the oil in, circle around, leave it, let it soak in and then go back. Three months later you can do it again and you just soak the underside of your plane like this, you can soak the side of your saw. I do this all the time, it really reduces the friction tremendously. Um, sometimes if I'm working on a very fine joint, I'll do the flat face of the, of the chisels, it really helps uh, reduce friction. And so that's that, but what was the other question? Uh, boom, boom, boom. Beyond one video, I see Paul Ewan roll it back. Uh, he lives in Norway, a technical name, blah, 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 brand name. Oh, he wants the name of the oil. It doesn't matter which oil. It doesn't matter which name. You can use any light machine oil. All right. Alex asks, I am, I am preparing to make my first workbench, and I'm planning on making this. Uh, I'm, le I'm left-handed. He's got questions here. I'm left-handed. How are vices typically configured for left-handed people? The vice itself, this main hub, this is the anchor to everything you do, is identical whether you're left-handed or right-handed. It's centrally placed. The bar in the middle is centrally placed in the vice. You can position this vice anywhere along the bench. What you find is it's much better to maximize the surface area where you grab your tools from. So my being right-handed, I like all my tools on the right-hand side or in front of me. If I were left-handed, I would want the surface area for the tools to be grabbed to my left. So I would move this vise to the opposite end of the bench. Nine inches from the end, like I have, or 10, 12 inches from the end of the bench, works fine. You can put them in the middle. I find it better to have it offset. All my tools are very conveniently placed that way. So that really answers that one, Alex. His next question, aside from the face vice that you use, is it possible to attach end vices to the workbench you use? He's actually going to make my workbench type. It's not the same as this one. My other one has a well in it. He's asking if you can put a face vise or a tail vise on the end. And you can just use this same vise, this tail vise, this uh, face vise, sorry, and, and attach it to the end. But you have to alter the uh, frame that you make for the legs to allow the, um, the long rods to go and the mechanism to go inside because otherwise the frame, or you have it overhanging, you can move the leg further in to accommodate the, uh, the length of the mechanism for winding. So that, that's easy enough to do. And if you go to the blog that I did on making your own workbench, it's an old blog, but it's still current, it's still good, and it shows you how to install the vices, and it's uh, both tail and end vice, or, or face and end vice. I'm getting, everything's confusing. Okay, so that's that one. The wood available to me is stud grade stuff at Lowe's. If you, for you around the world, don't know what Lowe's is, it's just a big box store. It's uh, the equivalent of B&Q, a bit more uh, lending itself to construction type of work. And it's where most of the people would go to buy their lumber to build their home. So he's asking whether what the, he says he knows that I've suggested straight grained wood where possible, least knotted wood and so on. Is there anything else he should be aware of? Yes, he should be aware that the shrinkage is going to be considerably higher because the wood used for building construction is usually around 18% by the time it leaves the lumber store. And that's way too high for furniture grade or for making things that will shrink. So if you have a wide bench top, it's going to shrink. If you have wide aprons, they're going to shrink. The best thing to do is get it home, put it in the workshop where the bench will ultimately be used, leave it there for a few weeks if you can, probably a month would work great, 
leave it there, sticker it, stack it, and it will distort more, but you can plane that out and make your bench from that, and then it will be fairly stable. After a couple of years, I've found that my benches need a, a little bit of truing up, but then after that, they very rarely move after. I've got some benches I've been using for 10 and 15 and 20 years. They're still as flat as they were after I did that second truing up. So that one. Finally, he says, are there any detailed photographs of how you add the drawers to the end of your bench? I am sorry to say no, I haven't had a chance to do this yet. Um, I have found that simply screwing a shelf on the end of the bench down here is enough to store my sharpening gear. I haven't done the, um, I certainly haven't done the draw and I haven't done these tills in the ends. That's something I need to get on with. Bjorn asks, has Paul commented upon the place power tools might have in the world of dedicated hand tool users? Yes, I've done different things, I've written things, they're not ostracized, we like power tools, we love using them, but one thing, you've just heard me say power tools, and that is so rare for me to use the term power tools because I don't believe they are power tools. That was something that was introduced in the 80s by the big, big power machine companies. They wanted to get away from calling it a power machine, they wanted to get down to power tool. It was like the separation between hand tool, old fashioned, fuddy duddy, didn't work very well, to the modern, you know, cutting edge machines. They wanted to make that transition so people would think differently, like this uh, belt sander or this um, router is just a power tool. This is the upper edge of the development. This is the uh, evolution uh, process that's um, improved on everything. That wasn't the case. What Those cuts always rely on a rotary cut. They don't quite do what your hand will do. But what they are good for, machines are very good for dimensioning lumber. They're the donkeys. They will do donkey work all day long. They will rip, plane, do all kinds of things. And that's where I draw the line. I would never, ever, ever in my life use a router to cut a dovetail. I've gone for 50 years. It's completely unnecessary in most cases. If I were a, a woodworker relying on uh, selling kitchen units or whatever, something that was more competitive, picnic tables, I would just use power tools. There would be no point in not doing so. But when it comes to fine work, when it comes to people getting satisfaction from the process of working, which is most of you, you want that. I want it. I love it. I love it when I spend a week making a rocking chair. Look at this. I just spent a week cutting every part of this from two inch stock. Well, I loved it. I just loved it. I'm 67 years old and I still love it. You can do it too. Enjoy it. And that's all we got time for. We're going to do some more of this. I hope this works. It, I've enjoyed it. It's, it's a good way of making contact with you. So tell your friends about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>